Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome again to the OECD Forum 2017. We're starting the session Bridging Divides. While you're taking your seats, let me take this opportunity to remind you that, as it was mentioned at the opening session, you can make your voice heard by participating in this session via Wisembly and Twitter. If you have done so already at the opening session, that's great, then you know how it works. If no, it's okay, because it's really, really easy. So you have to connect to the OECD hotspot and then go to Wisembly, check out the screens or the postcards on your seats. There are lots of postcards on your seats. If no, you can ask probably your neighbor to share one with you. So you can take a moment to do so now while everybody is taking their seats. And uh, as you can see, we are in the amphitheater one, so please connect to wisemly.com OECD one. Once again, that's OECD one. All you need to do is use Wisemly or tweet with the session's numbered hashtag, that's the one, OECD one, so that your questions and comments will show up on the big screen and also on my tablet during the session. You can make comments, ask questions, vote or like others' comments. All of this will help enrich our debate. You will not only hear the discussion on stage, but see what those around you and online think, and that is exactly your chance to speak. Please join the debate. And uh, we're going to open this session with the following questions. I'm going to ask the question now. You're going to have a moment to vote. There we go. Who do you feel can do most to address the growing divides in our societies? Governments, business, civil society, trade unions, or media? Who do you feel can do most to address the growing divides in our societies? Governments, business, civil society, trade unions, or media? While you're answering the question, I'm going to take a second to introduce myself. My name is Oleksandra Vakulina. I'm business editor at Euronews Television. Please vote. And I'm going to also tell you that we are going to wrap up this session with the same questions to see whether you change your mind over the next one hour and a half and uh, whether you confirm perhaps your point of view. And we have the results. Governments, 46%. That's the first and second would be civil society, 34 Business, 14%. Media, 4%. And trade unions, 2%. I'm flattered to introduce you our speakers. Sharon Barrow, Secretary General, International Trade Union, Confederation. Thank you very much for being with us today. Michelle Landell, CEO and member board of directors, president of executive committee at Sodexo. Chris Lee Hain, head of global policy and public affairs, Airbnb. Salil Shetty, secretary general, Amnesty International. I'm going to remind everybody in this room that interaction at this very session, I would say, is particularly important. And dear speakers, I would like to start with asking you to answer the same question. Can we please have the question back on the screens? I'm going to read it then. It's going to be back. So who do you feel can do most to address the growing divides in our societies, governments, business, civil society, trade unions, or media? Please, you have the microphones? Yes. Okay, well, I would say all of the above because we're facing a world where a globalized world has been, uh, inequality has been created by design. It's not inevitable. And yes, while government should be, in fact, in charge of 
making sure that wealth distribution, that the trust of their citizens uh, is intact. That hasn't happened because people know that the power doesn't reside with uh, governments in the main. They don't trust the establishment. They actually believe that uh, the one percent with the corporations included, the major corporations, not small to medium enterprises, actually control the power in their self-interest. So unless we all work together, and why is there mistrust? 73% of people in our recent global poll of 14 OECD or G20 countries and six others actually say they're frightened of losing their jobs. Almost 50% say that in fact uh, they don't believe their children will have decent work. And when 85% say that the power no longer resides with governments, it's controlled by global interests and they want the rules of the economy rewritten because the overwhelming majority can't live on the wages they're paid, with 80% saying a minimum wage is simply not enough to survive on, then we've got a world that's not been built in the interests of people. So unless we work together, then nothing's going to change. I've got the very first question uh, for you. Uh, we have it already from the audience. Trade unions, only 2% of the vote. Why? Well, that's because we're the good guys. And in fact, uh, we need the bad guys to change. No, I'm, I'm, being, uh, I'm joking, of course. But seriously, if you look at the demise of collective bargaining, again, by design, if you look at the fact that austerity, structural reform, all of those policies that were about the trickle-down theory haven't worked, who's actually been hurt? Working people. And if they're mistrustful of government, and we can't actually hold governments to account, which is a challenge for us and for civil society collectively, then, uh, of course, in the power balance, if governments were doing their job, they should hold the, the power. If our democracies worked, civil society should hold the power, inclusive of trade unions. The reality is the imbalance has to be corrected. So it's a chain. Yeah. Mr. Shalim, can you answer? Here is the microphone. I'm going to give you one here. Uh, could you please answer their question? Who do you feel can do most to address the growing divides in our societies, governments, business, civil society, trade unions, or media? Well, I, I, I guess it's, it's one of those, you know, it's a, it's a question which is very easy to ask and very difficult to answer. That's why. Um, so thank you for asking that question. <laughs> um, I, I think the fact is our societies are deeply divided and we have, uh, everyone's got a world view, a particular angle on what is causing that division. And I guess unless we have a shared analysis of what is causing uh, the current set of divisions, I think it's going to be quite difficult to get a pat answer on what the solution is. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think who should be responsible for bridging the divides? It has to be governments. So I'd, I'd vote with the House uh, on that point. Um, are they able to do it? Kind of that takes us into Sharon's response. I think, unfortunately, uh, our system of governance is not creating huge amounts of faith in the population. Uh, societies uh, are divided uh, along lines of how power is distributed in societies, and the electoral democratic system, which we've relied on for the last uh, several decades, is not giving us a sensible way of holding governments accountable, and it's not giving us a way in which power is equitably shared, particularly, between, uh, particularly in relation to the weakest sections of society. So I think, uh, yeah, I think you can say that everybody is responsible, but I think the accountability has to lie with government. With the government. Chris Lehain, Mr. Lehain, do you agree? First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for thank hosting you for this being panel. Here with it's us. great to be here with, with this panel. Uh, and also thank you everyone for attending this morning. I thought the Secretary General's comments earlier uh, to begin the day were great. And if you think about it, I think today, if I'm remembering correctly, is the 73th anniversary of D-Day. I think June 3rd was the 69th anniversary of the Marshall Fund. So it's appropriate to be having these types of conversations about how we build bridges uh, in light of where we are. I think history is pretty informative. Um, so the, 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 it was a multiple choice question. Um, I would tend to agree that if there was an option to say I can all remind the, you all the options. Would you yes, want? No, I, I remember yeah. them. I, I would have said all of the above as well, but that wasn't one of the options I was provided. And, uh, and so 
I'll actually go with, um, with civic society, which I define as community, and, and I'll explain why. Um, first of all, um, and this is coming certainly from a tech perspective, uh, you know, I do think at some level there are entities that have gotten ahead of society. I think technology is certainly one of those. Um, I think some of the challenges that we're facing is there's been a lack of alignment in terms of how far ahead uh, entities like tech have gotten uh, from overall society. Um, and I think that all of us have a responsibility to address that. I think particularly those of us who are in tech have a real responsibility to address that. Uh, but ultimately, if you sort of look around, I think a core challenge in all of this is that for the va vast majority of people, what we would call the middle class in the U.S., people call working families here in Europe, uh, you know, there's a real sense that democracy has not been delivering for them for the last 20 or 30 years. You look back over the course of the 20th century when there were all sorts of challenges, uh, democratic systems and democratic processes usually rose to the challenge and addressed those issues. Uh, for the last 20 or 30 years, if you're a middle class or working family, uh, you've been promised an awful lot, but have not really necessarily seen those things delivered. Um, and I think that's most salient and prominent in the issue of economic inequality. Um, and I see that really as a wage issue. Um, you know, what technology has done is increased productivity um, and really helped create huge opportunity for certain segments of society, but you haven't seen as that productivity has gone up, wages increase. In fact, wages have stagnated for a lot of middle class people. Um, and, and I think that is then feeding into this larger perception that you know, democracy is not necessarily serving uh, people as well as it should and well as it could, which then is leading to larger issues of trust. And I think you touched on that uh, earlier and democracies require trust. And so I go back and as I said earlier, I'm a fan of history. I was a history major in college. Uh, and I go back and look at history for some lessons and some uh, information and you go back to the ancient Greeks, you go back to uh, Pericles, uh, and there was this concept in ancient Greece called phyloxenia. Phyloxenia, by the way, is the opposite of xenophobia. Uh, and phyloxenia at its core was this Greek city-state concept that uh, for democracy to flourish, for uh, society to flourish, uh, you ultimately needed three, stool, three legs to a stool. You needed to have a, a flourishing economy, uh, you needed to have uh, government institutions that people trusted, uh, and most importantly, you needed to have a strong civic society because those other two legs reflected a strong civic society. Uh, and to have a strong civic society, uh, you have to have people who are willing to welcome people from different backgrounds uh, and different places uh, to be able to build and go forward. Uh, and so to me, ultimately, to be able to answer all of these questions, uh, it is going to come back to a community, a community that takes action, a community that takes responsibility, a community that begins to act on what's going on. Uh, and so to answer the question, I would say civic society, but defined as community. And the last point I will make on this um, is that I began by saying that I thought there were some things that were misaligned, particularly the role of tech getting ahead of a lot of issues. Uh, I think part of the solution lies in tech. Uh, we are now in an age where you're seeing these digital network platforms. That's what Airbnb is, which I represent. Uh, and digital network platforms are different than other types of organizations. They're not built on hierarchical organizational structures. They're actually based on communities. We have 160 million plus people who've been on our platform. Um, so within tech, uh, there is, I think, some, uh, some lessons in terms of how you can potentially leverage those communities to organize and begin to address some of the bigger issues that we face in society. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle Landell, I would like to, you to vote for the question. Shall I, shall I repeat it? Oh, I think I... Or I, the I, options. We have <laughs> governments, business, civil well, society, trade yeah. unions, and media. Okay, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I would say all of the above, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, my conviction is that uh, in the end, uh, I think all of us, government, companies, uh, every organization, have to think about human beings and people, and women and men who makes our world. And the world we be, will be better if all of us, we work together, and if we put human beings at the center. And in that respect, I think companies um, have a, import, a very important role to play, whether they are SMEs uh, or large organizations, whether they are local or global, uh, we are creating jobs. If I take the case of Sodexo, we are the 19th largest employer in the world, uh, we are in 80 countries, 
We create jobs and our responsibility is to make those jobs sustainable. We employ a lot of people who, in general, when they join us, many of them have no qualification. Uh, we are acting as a social elevator. We help them um, get a job, grow in their business. We increase, we're trying to increase employability. Um, that's really what we need to do, continue to train. We need to help them move to uh, the next generation of jobs which are affected by the new technologies. That's what we have to do. And uh, we have to reconcile. You know, in the end, the company is, uh, is about uh, clients, people, and shareholders. And if we find the way to uh, satisfy each of these constituencies and make sure that uh, we bring value uh, to the same extent, I think we'll have a better world. Now, uh, we do, you know, companies also, I was thinking about that uh, very recently, act for a better world in terms of the environment. And uh, when you think about uh, the COP21 last year in Paris, you've seen an enormous uh, movement of companies who wants to play their role in this society to improve and to make sure that we uh, protect our planet. Uh, so in that sense, organization, private organization have an immense role to play. But when you think about that, governments as well, and civil society, so all the actors. But um, as you know, a big employer, our responsibility is to make sure that we make those jobs uh, real jobs, make them respected um, and sustainable. Thank you very much. Uh, you remember I asked you why was uh, trade unions just 2%. We have another question. Why media that low as well? I think I'm representing the media here, but I'm not going to answer that one. I'm going to ask you to answer. Why media was that low on the vote? What do you think? Why there was less trust, if we can say so? Well, I think uh, media has lost trust because people don't trust the messages. When the defence of a current system is the overwhelming uh, message that people get, and as I said, they know that they're deeply anxious about their daily lives, then mistrust in everybody is absolute. There's no doubt that you're seeing people retreat into nationalism because they don't trust the global economy. And when you ask them what worries them, it's their jobs, it's living on the edge, and it's about uh, climate, it's about uh, um, terrorism, it's about issues that uh, for their children. So unless we do something about it, from labour, the recipe is very simple. If you have universal social protection, so people can trust that they can survive, and remember 70% of the world's people have little or no social protection. If you have a minimum wage that's evidence-based on which you can live, what's the basket of goods that a family needs to live on? And if, in fact, you have uh, the right to collective bargaining with uh, both national and global uh, capacity with companies like Sodexo that, on the one hand, want to do the right thing, but I can show you in all supply chains, people who are in informal work, often in modern slavery, not in Sodexo, but in Sodexo, short-term contracts. And so people are frightened. If they're on short-term contracts and they're trying to raise a family and they don't, therefore they're frightened to, uh, to unionise because they're frightened of losing their jobs, which is the overwhelming anti-union sentiment of major corporations, then the SDGs, if we're not all working together, are just a remote dream. We can have a world that's zero poverty and zero carbon by 2050, if we choose to, and that's why we all need to work together. If we don't and self-interest prevails, people are not fooled. They know the power lies with the 1% and they're angry about it. That's why they don't trust media or governments or anybody other than those who are making them fool's promises which will never be realised. So they're looking for the alternate voice to help them out. But frankly, if you look at the last week or so, what I've been really impressed about people working together, is when uh, Donald Trump said he would withdraw from the climate agreement, it was business, us, civil society, who all came together and said, we have to do it, the sustainable future is not an option, and so we need to work together irrespective of those governments who won't, with the governments that will. That's 
the best news of the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Would you want to, if anybody wants to comment? Thank you. Sure, I'll just add a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I think the question may have, the way the question was framed may have led to uh, where the media uh, was listed. I think um, uh, for the most part, the media is not necessarily looked at as the answer to the challenges as much as actually covering uh, what is going on. And I think that, you know, it's called the fourth estate for a reason. Uh, and that is to have a flourishing, successful, robust democracy, you do need to have a strong fourth estate. And I do think that we've, we're going through a process right now in terms of how the media works, uh, where news is much more fragmented, segmented, uh, people can self-select where they get information from. Depending on where you are in the world, the media is no longer playing the traditional role of being a referee or uh, umpire and sort of establishing what the facts are and what the facts aren't. Uh, and I do think that that is a challenge um, Another one in, for you, in terms you of see, holding, the media, the one yes, you were. Yeah, in terms of holding democratic institutions responsible and accountable, we don't succeed as democracies if you do not have a strong fourth estate, period. Um, and the way information is being conveyed and the way information is being transmitted uh, has made that harder. Uh, I am ultimately an optimist and think that we're going through a period. Um, I think we're going to begin to figure those types of things out. Um, I do come back to what I said earlier, which is I do think that there is enormous power in community and the ability of community to organize. And you're also seeing these networked uh, communities actually begin to hold people and institutions accountable. Uh, and so I do think as we go forward, you're gonna see a melding of the traditional historic media um, with more crowdsourced, more network-based ways to cover information and transmit information. Uh, and you can see that even in terms of how politicians and other elected officials are being covered. There is an enormous amount of information being put forth because of the ability for every single individual person to actually become their own reporter. But, but can I also Please. come back on that? Because I hope that's true. And I believe desperately in the power of community because that's what we do organise people. So I want that to be true and you can see pockets of it, I agree. But you know, when people talk about fake news, one of the worst exports from my country was, was Murdoch. He's dominated the media in many countries. If you look at some of the elections, you will find the same editorial line about the same economic orthodoxy that has delivered inequality and built the mistrust of people. So, yes, I think the media uh, uh, fragmentation is a good thing on the one hand, but what it's also doing to our workers in journalism who used to be independent, investigative journalists with a pride in telling the truth from all sides, they're fragmented, they're on franchise, they're franchisees or... Uh, independent contractors, so-called, trying to eke out a living again on short-term contracts. And if you look at the salaries of journalists, those in, uh, in the independent, uh, so-called independent contract arena have gone from being a decent middle-income salary to struggling to get by. That's not a future you want for your sons and daughters. So if we want to change globalisation, it's got to be the sons and daughters test, whether it's the media, whether it's work through our supply chains, whether it's direct employment. And the other problem with this is nobody tells the stories of the workforce. We have only 60% in formal work, and more than 50% of those, percent of those are in short-term, uh, insecure, often unsafe contracts on low pay in our supply chains. 40% are in the informal economy, no rights, no minimum wages, no rule of law, and up to 45 million in, in uh, global uh, uh, modern slavery and both informal work and modern slavery are now in our supply chains. Yet our corporations will tell you they proudly employ 300,000, 400,000 people globally. Actually, pick any one of them and I can show you one, 1.5, 2 million hidden workforce because we outsource responsibility. So either we set, we rewrite the rules, including to support the media so that it can be free and independent again, or we will have more of the same. Mr. Shetty, you wanted to comment. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, if you think of societies as being quite deeply divided now, media is also deeply divided. So uh, nobody actually believes that uh, most of the media is independent and impartial. And that's kind of at the root of the problem. So if you look at the Edelman sort of annual trust barometer surveys, uh, mainstream media is dipping, social media is dipping in terms of trust. Uh, but online media, uh, you know, and independent online media, 
uh, has actually gained in trust because it's a question of whom can you trust the question on what you have just said how to bridge our society when we face a post-truth era in which we face yeah, lies in I mean, social so networks so we had for example you know so it depends on of course fake news is used quite conveniently these days so as amnesty international we did a expose of the Syed Naya prison in Damascus where 13,000 people had been executed by the Assad regime over a period of few years and Assad went on mainstream television and said you know amnesty is fake news so it's one of those things which you can just use depending on it's kind of one of those catch phrases but I think the situation is uh, in a sense we're talking about bridging divides but the fact of the matter, what we've seen, whether it's in Philippines or Hungary or Turkey or now with Brexit and Trump, is that you have leaders who are very systematically deepening the divide. So you have some legitimate grievances that people are facing, but you scapegoat. Instead of solving the grievance, what you do is you scapegoat, you know, the Muslim, the refugee, the woman, the LGBT, and that gives you political benefit in the short run and that is why truth becomes very secondary and that's the context in which I think there's a kind of falling uh, reliance on media but it's even worse because in the last year if you look at the attacks on dissent you know anybody who's uh, asking any questions of these governments um, you're finding that they're they're, fa they're facing a kind of uh, restriction of space but even worse i mean the numbers in 2016 here is another one just follow up question can problems or divides be effectively addressed if the media to effectively communicate and engage the general population yeah i mean i think you know the, the media can only do so much in the face of this onslaught and i was going to say you know when we say civil society i, I think we may be referring to international ngos here but it's a much because the people who are under attack are journalists bloggers are trade unionists environmental activists it could be anybody anti-corruption activists so civil society in that sense in terms of the attack on civil society is much more broad and the numbers are very shocking you know we've had 94 countries in 2016 where activists of one sort or the other have faced threats or attacks we've had 22 countries where people have been killed and this is for peacefully raising their voice so I think the issue is much more serious than bridging divides. It's about actually survival of dissent, survival of basic freedoms. Thank if you. I, if I could just add a, a, a quick thought here, which is, you know, there's the old phrase that the pen can be mightier than the sword. Um, you know, I do think in this day and age, and it's been proven countless times, that, you know, a tweet can be more powerful than uh, a sword or, or a different type of weapon. And I think that that is the reality. Um, there was more information created in the last two years alone than was in the entire history of humanity up to that point in time. There is bountiful amounts of information being made available uh, because, of, because of the power of social media, because technology is giving every individual person the ability and, uh, and capacity to be able to communicate. There's very little secrets uh, anymore. There may be fake news, that, uh, and, and, and that's another set of issues, and I think what the fake news gets at um, is less the fact that there's information out there and more of the fact that people are self-selecting the information that they are believing in. And when I talk about us going through a transition, that is part of the transition. Uh, we have gone from a time period when there were trusted news outlets that said something and that people believed it and then you could take action based on that. That doesn't exist as much anymore. People go and find the different types of outlets and what information they are gonna believe in, whether it's objectively true or not and then individually are acting in their own ways. And I think part of this transition is going to be how do we actually determine what is objectively the truth out there? What are the facts out there? Because there's a lot of information. It's not a lack of information. It is what is that objectively accurate and right. And I do think that you know, when you start to see how crowdsourcing works, how networks work, uh, there can be a power um, in using networks to be able to collectively identify what in fact is the truth and what is objectively the case. Uh, Mr. Landau, I've got a question to you. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, you know, going into something probably bigger and something vague, but still, I know it's a very hard question, another one to ask, but to what extent is globalization to blame for divides being deeper, for trust, you know, sinking? To what extent is globalization to be blamed for it? Well, you know, I think globalization is a fact. And uh, the world is interconnected. Uh, technology is also global. 
So we will not avoid globalization. And actually, globalization has brought a lot of positive. Uh, we forget that uh, probably more than one billion people have got out of poverty because of this globalization. So, but you know, we have to, uh, um, when I think about the role of companies, because this is what I know the best, um, I think um, to be accepted in society, companies need to uh, make sure that their primary focus is not the shareholders only, right? Because again, we need shareholders, we need clients, and we need to understand what these customers want, right? But far from and foremost, we need people, we need individuals, because at the end of the day, companies are people, are human beings. And uh, so clients, customers, people, and shareholders, they have to find you know, the value that they expect. And frankly, uh, unless we you know, consider people and put them at the center and consider that the well-being of people will drive progress and will drive performance, um, we will fail. My view is that organization, companies, any organization, uh, you know, should really uh, be uh, driven by very strong ethics and, um, you know, authenticity. What the world is lacking today is authenticity. Uh, we, as a company, we're not perfect. We do things right. We sometimes make mistakes. What's important for us is to progress, to engage people, and uh, within what type of value scheme we do that. You know, I think that's all about that. So putting human beings and their values and, and respect uh, at the center is, I think, fundamental. And uh, I think we've lost some of this you know, in, the, in today's world. And uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to, to bring back this generosity because, you know, the world deserves the generosity. People deserve generosity. And I think company can play a big role with that. And I have a question. Uh, which government policies best help you create sustainable jobs? You can see it on the screens now. You know, I think that the government has a very big responsibility in terms of education, right? We do have a responsibility in terms of education because we have to constantly train uh, our people and pr prepare them for the next uh, job. So, but uh, I, I really believe, and in my business, which is a service business, uh, where we hire people, uh, where we really train them and help them, you know, uh, going up the ladder, uh, I really believe that education is central. So, uh, and those uh, education policy probably have to be reinvented. You know, when I think about that and I look around me in the world, I don't see many governments talking about the influence of um, artificial intelligence um, in, you know, uh, in, the, in the future. A and frankly, uh, we need now to, uh, and maybe it's a dream, but we, we probably need to uh, connect uh, artificial intelligence with human intelligence and put this artificial intelligence to serve human intelligence and not the contrary. And I think the government and the type of education we give, um, and there are many, many bright people thinking about that, need to, you know, tackle this problem. <coughs> Thank you. Just support... Uh, those comments because this comes back to if business and trade unions and governments are working together with civil society in, in uh, combination, we can realise that new world of generosity, of rights, of inclusion. And the shareholder model has done a great disservice to the CEOs who've had to meet the demands of double and triple digit profits at the expense of everything else. If, if there's one thing that's probably driven that whole uh, dislocation from people and, uh, and the employers, it's that model. But if we get it right, 
we can reinvent the wheel. And I work with the B team because they're a group of CEOs who believe just that, that their companies ought to be 100% human, that they ought to be based on the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. And of course, they're committed to, to net zero. And I did the commission on uh, business and, and sustainable development goals who actually signed off business, labor, civil society on the need for a new social contract. So that's exactly where we want to be. And you can start with the OECD's recommendation on wages. Because if you think about the fact that you walk the supply chains in a country like the Philippines or Indonesia, one of the benchmarks of anxiety is whether or not a family can pay for their baby formula. One, one child, one day's wages, one week's baby formula. Two children, two days wages. That's ridiculous. And when we know we could fix that, with around 50 US dollars a month in those countries and, uh, and the profits of our, supply of our big uh, uh, multinationals through their supply chains is up to $17,000 per supply chain worker per year. Do the sums. So there are things we can do based on rights, generosity of spirit, 100% human, whatever you want to call it, that change the future. On digitalisation, can I just say two things? Digital, uh, uh, the digital economy, the digitalisation are the tracks of the future. But if we don't fix the base of society today, then we're just going to create more divides in the future. You know, more than 50%. We all use technology as if it's our, you know, now our birthright. But in fact, uh, exactly. But in fact, um, uh, when you think 50% of the world's people don't have access yet to the internet. And when you look at, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's uh, uh, people working on uh, across the internet to find employment and so on, we need the same things. We need social protection, a, a contract price that's a floor or minimum living wage, the right to bargain, whether it's cooperatives built by civil society and communities or whether it's unions operating in the, in the online and offline environment, the right to bargain collectively for a fair contract price, and you need people looking out for people so that we're not simply driving a profit-based approach and everybody else be damned, or otherwise we will have a retreat into nationalism. I agree globalisation is with us to stay, and most of us want a world where people are able to be mobile, where you're respected, whether you're a native or a migrant or a refugee, with equal treatment. But we won't get it if we don't do exactly that and reconstruct a social contract that people trust. Mr. Shet. Yeah, I, you know, just listening to uh, Anhel Guria this morning as well, um, we've been saying the same thing, at least I've been going to conferences for 20, 30 years where we've been saying pretty much the same thing. You know, we need growth with redistribution. It's not either or, you know, all of these uh, mantras which we're very good at repeating. So I often wonder whether, you know, it's, it's not a question of whether there's artificial intelligence or not. It, the question is whether we have any intelligence at all. Right. That is really the question that comes to my mind when, you, when you're looking at what's happening in the world today. And it's all fine to talk about things at this very global level. We have to take it down to really the ground level. And, and if you look we at... We have to go to local levels first? Yeah, or I mean, I think, you which know, level would be the yeah, first? I mean, I'm saying local is a good place to start because it's better to look local to global than the other way around. And at the local level, if you, un if you see why are, what, is, what is causing divisions, at the heart of it, you find discrimination, you know, discrimination against women, against untouchables, indigenous people, whatever the group is, you know, religious minorities, racial minorities. So if you don't crack that issue of discrimination, and the second is you have policies which are completely blind, you know, which you, you say inclusive growth, but you have policies which are actively creating exclusion. So it's not a question of whether globalization is good or bad. What does that even mean? And, and certainly I'm the first one to say that even an organization like Amnesty International or civil society, you know, we need to understand the other because we also sit in an echo chamber. You know, we talk to ourselves. One of the things which I always like saying is if you take the Brexit vote in the UK, you know, which, which ended up with about half the population voting to leave, I always ask my colleagues in Amnesty, you know, like, do you know anybody who actually voted to leave? And they don't actually know anybody who voted to leave. But so they were there. it's yeah. I mean, obviously, half the country has voted to leave, 
and we don't know who these people are. So we sit and talk to ourselves, which is a big part of our, of our challenge. You know? so, so do you think it's very important to go and find those people who voted to leave the EU, to talk to them, to see what they feel, what they Absolutely. think, how do they leave? I mean, no question about it. You know, we have to understand the issues. I'm not suggesting that we compromise on, on basic values because that's another problem. You know, we've had in Europe particularly, uh, because you had this extreme sort of anti-refugee and kind of populist sentiment, you had mainstream political parties starting to sound like them in order to get like get their votes. And I think that's fundamentally flawed. We are in a time in history when you have to stand up for values, stand up for human rights. It's not a time to compromise, but it's also a time to listen and understand as to what the issues are. You can't pretend that there are no issues. Do you think we're already in the governments at local levels and you know global levels? Do you think we're ready to listen and to understand at all times? Well, if we don't, we pay the price. You know, this is what happens, and we—it's as if we never knew these problems existed. You <laughs> know, that's why I find it very bizarre. We have the same conversations in every conference. If I yes. could just jump in, just pick up on some of the comments uh, earlier, um, which is I, I do think we are in a digital age. The five largest companies in the world are all networked global digital companies. In the next 10 years, 100% uh, of the world will have access uh, to broadband and mobile. First time in, since humans left the old Dubai Gorge where anyone will be able to connect with anybody anywhere. And I think what that suggests or signifies is that we do need new rules and new approaches to get to some of the very objectives, some of the ones that you outlined, getting back to that social contract. Um, but the world is changing, and how do we actually try to align those changes with that social contract? And I'll just give two quick examples that are relevant to us at Airbnb. But on Airbnb, you know, our hosts, 70% uh, or more, you know, are what we in the States call middle class folks using their home, which is typically their greatest expense. And they're able to list their home and make 97%. Which is also quite of a trust issue. I'm sorry to, you know, yeah, leaving your home to somebody is also a trust issue. You face terrible absolutely. Day. That's think what of, the business think, is built on. Think about on. the fact that on a weekly basis, we have a million people staying in a stranger's homes. Think about the fact on New Year's Eve, we set a record, at least to the best of our knowledge, for an accommodation company where around 2 million people spent a night in a stranger's home. And Somewhere in a time else. period when people are talking about building walls, shutting doors, closing windows, to have two million people stay in a stranger's home, I think says something pretty profound about the higher angels in, within humanity. Um, but they're using 97% of the money that they list their house for to make supplemental income. That's on top of whatever their job may be. In the States, that translates into about 6,000 US dollars a year. That actually is making up the wage difference that they've lost uh, over the last 10 years or so. And you also think, and um, I'm someone who prior to being at Airbnb was very involved uh, in labor in the United States. Um, has been, have been a card-carrying member of labor. Um, and one of the things that we've put in, uh, in place in the, in the US on the Airbnb platform is a livable wage standard for those cleaners, those domestic cleaners uh, who clean people's homes uh, on our platform. Uh, and the way it works is that uh, a badge goes up, this will be available, by the way, at Labor Day in the United States, a badge goes up uh, on a host's uh, 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 listing uh, that signifies that they are paying a livable wage for the domestic cleaner. By the way, in the United States, domestic cleaners have been amongst the most exploited and underserved mm -hmm. in society, traditionally immigrant women. Uh, yes, and informal, right? And what we know from what we can see through the power of the network is that those travelers will affirmatively select a host who is paying $15 a wage, an hour for, a, for, for their cleaning, right? And so that is using the power of a network to actually drive a better, bigger social good. I'm not saying, by the way, that this is the solution to everything <laughs> or it is the perfect solution. We're learning all of this stuff as we go along. What I am saying is that how do we think creatively and come up with new approaches to get at some of those basic human needs that we do need to deliver on? But it's the dialogue. You know, it, that's what's working there is the dialogue. And indeed, we know that in the US, Airbnb is talking to uh, the unions. It's the same with... Uh, you know, uh, care.com, we're having those conversations, but we're having them. Nothing wrong with that. But governments are not having them. And my challenge to governments is... Governments what, are not having dialogues. But they're, they're not having any dialogue with these companies or with us about how you manage the future in, uh, on a digital world. And we say, what's a business? Like, we have challenged. We say to... I've said it very public arguments with Travis, the, you know, the head of Uber. And I say, look, it's not the technology. In fact, our research shows us people aren't worried about the technology, they're worried about their jobs and their wages in a tech world. 
And so what we, uh, I do think there are ethical questions about some technologies, but therefore society as a whole, including all of us. But when you look at what defines a business, that's the problem. If governments aren't defining the rules for a business so that they have a social license to operate, that they do ensure minimum living wages and social protection. And with Airbnb, there's, I mean, it's time on a tradition, you know, poor parents always rented out rooms to actually supplement their income. The difference here is when businesses that were direct employers are using digital platforms of any kind to actually subjugate their social licence, which is about responsibility for em their employees, about paying their taxes, paying into uh, social protection and, uh, and genuinely being a good corporate citizen, then we've got a problem. And that's where the absence of government in the dialogue and the, and the regulation for the future is really hurting people and consequently part of the mistrust that's deep and is dividing whole communities. We do know many of those people, by the way, who voted to remain because we've had to talk to them. They're our people. And I can tell you what's driving their, uh, their fears. It's the anxiety, again, about their jobs, their wages, their children, and they have to blame someone. They've been made promises by governments, but whether it's singular or multilateral, four years and of course they feel their lives have got more precarious. So until you switch that around and engage them in a conversation about what will make a difference, we're going to have bigger and bigger mistrust and therefore divides. Mr. Can, can I say one, one other thing that, you know, we, whenever we talk about inequality and, and uh, divisions, we, off, we focus a lot on income inequality, but a key reason why we have inequality is also because there's voice inequality, which means that not all segments of society have an equal voice. And if people are not able to raise their voice and hold governments to account, this is a big part of the problem. So whatever Chris said, Sharon said about the rules of the game, etc., is absolutely right. But in the majority of the countries we're talking about, we don't have institutions which can actually you know, make sure that basic freedoms are upheld, that you have an independent judiciary, the institutions, access to justice, there's remedy. You know, you can't talk about human rights and all the essentials when you don't have a system which functions, which is why your SDG 16 uh, talks about all of this. So again, it's, it's not as if we don't know what needs to be done. I think we should just start doing it rather than just talking about it. Uh, here's another question. How can you get more you can see it, yeah, more uh, young, intelligent people to influence and have an impact for the world when many governments do not employ them. I think, uh, you know, youth and the issues of youth everywhere in the world is also, it could stand like a, a separate issue on that panel, no? Well, you know, <coughs> I think again, um, uh, we employ a lot of people and a lot of young people and uh, as a company, um, you know, we, um, what we need to do is really uh, propose a future to people and uh, give sense to what they do. And uh, I think organizations who have um, a real purpose, who have ethics, who have values um, and who engage uh, people uh, I think have a chance to retain these people, motivate them. You know, one of the things that uh, we, we can do as a large organization is really do uh, very concrete things. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, give you an example of what we've done uh, to, uh, you know, promote employment in uh, developing countries through our supply chain program where we uh, We've helped and we've spent, you know, a billion euros uh, in FY16 uh, to really support employment and uh, uh, SMEs, right? And those SMEs, actually a third of them are run by women. Uh, so with that, we create jobs, we engage young people, we engage, uh, you know, our organization, and that really motivates people, right? And that gives sense to what we do. The other thing that we need to do, right, is really be concrete, um, and we have this chance. Um, you know, we, uh, we've developed, we're very, very keen to, um, about building a company which represents our society. And uh, when you think about gender, gender diversity, 
I think uh, organization can play a very big role to promote gender diversity. You know, one of the challenge of society and things which really drives inequality is gender-based violence, and uh, which is a f f very, very important issue. Uh, so when we, and I see that, when we engage, you know, our population, our people um, behind that, um, those uh, actions, those actions which are authentic and which are really make a difference in society, it motivates them and, uh, you know, um, it's a, a, a tool for us to retain this. So I think we have a lot of tools to do that, but we have to do concrete things, right? I think, you know, when you talk about young people, one of the things that we have to realize is that when I talked about a lot of repression, et cetera, across the world, there's also been another very interesting phenomenon in the last year that we've, uh, I think, his historically, we've not had so many mass public protests ever before. 94 countries saw mass public protests in 2016. And a majority of those were led or driven by young people. Uh, partly because of unemployment, but but more because of a kind of feeling that you know leaders are unaccountable, whether in government or in corporations, and the mainstream systems are not giving them solutions. So people are going out on the streets, and I want to make this point because you know while it's easy in these days to end up leaving a session like this quite uh, downbeat and depressed. Um, Let's also look at some of the great celebratory yes, moments <laughs> which, which we've seen. I mean, women came out in Poland. Uh, you know, when you have a government who's trying to crush sexual reproductive rights, and they stopped it. We saw massive women's marches in, yeah, in so many places I mean, around the world. And young people in Burkina Faso. I mean, take a look at a small country like the Gambia. You know, if anybody had told me that Yaya Jame, who was this completely lunatic, uh, you know, he was running the country for 20 years, God was speaking to him, he was curing AIDS, uh, you know, that he would go without a single drop of blood being mm -hmm. shed. It happened. ECOWAS stood up. Look at what's happened in Colombia, you know, I mean, so, and you have enlightened leaders at least showing up in a few places. I mean, uh, you know, we were told by Harper in Canada that Canadians don't like refugees for nine years. Uh, when you have Trudeau coming and saying, no, actually, that's a core value of this country. So, you know, between enlightened leadership and people standing up for their rights, I think there is, that's essentially, in my view, where hope lies. Just a second, I want to, I want to ask you for a question on protest. You said that we saw more protests than ever last year. Do you think it's because, uh, you know, people had to stand up more because they were less satisfied than ever, or maybe they felt heard as ever? Maybe, or they felt that that's exactly the moment for them to be heard. Why? No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think it's been mentioned, technology has allowed us to organize in a much faster way than before. So there's kind of many facilitating factors. People are feeling more empowered, more informed, no question about that. But also the mainstream ways of remedy are not dealing with the problem. So people feel that there's not much option. You can't write a petition or you can't go and meet your local leader because they don't respond. So mass protest is the way. And it's not in the places you think of. A lot of this mm -hmm. happened in Africa, in Asia, and you know, places where you don't normally, like you know, teachers in Ghana protesting, for example. You know, that's at, at a large scale. So quite interesting things happened last year. Yes, please. Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I'm one of the reasons I'm incredibly optimistic ultimately about the future actually is because of the millennial generation. You know, at Airbnb, 60% of the people who travel on our platform uh, are millennials. Um, Do you think it's because they trust more, they are used more to digital? Yeah, more than half, digital, uh, yeah. and more than half of them are women, by the way. Um, uh, I'm the 29th oldest person in the company, um, which tells you something. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the really interesting things, and, um, you know, I see you see this a lot in, when you look at the, the polling data um, uh, on campaign activity, uh, is, you know, millennials are incredibly values-oriented, incredibly mission-driven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they value authenticity and experience, you know, far more than material gain. Uh, in particular, um, over 80% of millennials globally uh, believe that um, a company should be evaluated and whether it's good or bad for society before you make a decision about whether you're gonna use that product. Um, and you think about going over the next 10 years, millennials will represent half of all voters. Uh, they will be determining who's in office. Uh, they'll represent over 75% of the key demographic from a consumer perspective, meaning they'll make decisions about what products are succeeding, what companies are succeeding or not. Uh, and because of their attitudes, 
Uh, and because they really are globally and, and re reflect those attitudes all across the world, um, I think there's an incredible future that is on the horizon as they begin to kick in more and more, both as voters and as consumers. And you know, if you want to just look at a concrete example, there's 50 states in the United States. If you had just counted the millennial vote in the last presidential election, 49 of those 50 states voted for Hillary Clinton. Well, at the same time, it's very important how to make sure that we're not leaving behind too many, you know, when, isn't it? Apart from the millennials. Yeah, well, I was addressing the question as to, you know, I think the question sort of di yeah. was directed at how yes. do we deal with millennials, sure. and I think that the millennials offer, uh, I think they're an incredible generation, and I think they offer uh, an awful lot of hope in terms of where we're going. We've had a conversation here talking about a lot of the challenges that we face. I think that generation is equipped to address those challenges. I think they have a, a global view. I think those views are reflected wherever they are in the world. Uh, and they're going to be kicking in now as some of the people who are going to be making the key decisions. And so I am very optimistic in terms of where the world is going because of that generation. We had uh, grandmothers going out on the street in Venezuela last week. So it is across the spectrum, but the question was about youth. But, but let me just address the youth question because I agree with that, but there's also a big divide mm -hmm. as well. Where millennials are globally oriented, then they share all those values. But there's a Harvard study that Rich Trumka quotes that actually shows that 30% of millennials don't believe democracy's been good for them. So if anyone is worried about their democracy's withering, and indeed we are, then that's a group we need to engage. And if you go to the divide for young people, then Tunisia is the symbol because people went out on the streets because young people couldn't get jobs. And indeed, what happened was revolutionary. You know, business, union, civil society working together, won the Nobel Peace Prize. They put together a constitution that is one of the strongest in the world in democratic rights and values terms. And yet, what happened? The IMF and others rolled in with their austerity platforms and young people are still agitated because they can't get jobs and good jobs. And they, they're agitating about a second revolution. So let's not ignore the fact that we can't allow the generations to be divided. We need intergenerational solidarity. But it goes back to a question you asked before. Which country would you put up as actually creating jobs? And if you look at the miracle economy of the day, for me it's Sweden. You know, Sweden had 23% youth unemployment in a, in a European, rich European country just several years ago. They've spent uh, around 2%, a little bit more in their economy, 1% on ag and infrastructure, 1% on refugees, integrating refugees. Mm -hmm. It's created uh, jobs, they have a surplus, they're growing at 4.2%, and youth unemployment's down below 6%. So if we want the answers, then we can find them. But it is about investing in people, creating the jobs, and stopping the division that's being generated by many of our governments and institutions, that it's somehow an insider-outsider piece. I say you really want to fire the mother or father who's supporting a family on a good job, with a good wage and good security, to hire the young person on, uh, on an insecure, low wage? I don't think so. So let's create the jobs. And the employers and us have a, a unity contract on, uh, on apprenticeships. But can we get governments to help business, working with unions, scale them up? No, we can't. The good news for us is that of uh, the 75 per cent of people, or of the people who say 75 per cent, sorry, 75 per cent of the world's people say unions are a critical role in, uh, in their communities, but young people are the strongest in that vote. So I'm optimistic too but we need to engage in them. And I just wanted to defend Airbnb a little here. I think it is true we have to look at the role, if you look at these questions, of, uh, of the, the business contract, as I said, what creates a business, are they registered and so on. But, you know, where it says that they're actually um, taking over hotel jobs and that people have to use Airbnb to supplement their income, I think you had an acknowledgement that wages are in fact too low and that you shouldn't have to supplement your income in, in a way that uh, ha has you renting out your home just because you can't make ends meet. But on the other hand, if we work together to make sure that hotel businesses are not outsourcing their responsibility 
for direct employment. And if the conditions around the work, the jobs for cleaners, for uh, uh, agents and so on, are good, paying decent jobs that where you can have freedom of association to organise, then we can work with Airbnb. It's about sorting out the, the decent work deficiencies, not about saying that new businesses are necessarily uh, um, uh, ones we wouldn't accept. Ms. Tantel, would you want to comment? Because I think I saw you nodding while Cheryl was speaking on the... <laughs> Well, you know, I, again, um, I think that uh, uh, what the young people will um, value is an organization which gives sense to their lives, right? And uh, organization can do that um, within their scope of business, but also um, helping uh, communities and local communities to progress, and that's the role of big organization like Sodexo, and you know, and there are many, many organizations around the world which are playing that role, and um, you know, in order for us to retain those uh, millenniums and to attract them is to propose them, you know, more than a job, you know, something that they can really engage personally, and uh, and you know, which value their qualities, which really give them another perspective. But I also believe that, uh, you know, there are many, many countries in the world where um, those millenniums have no chance because of lack of education. And I think that uh, the, uh, what uh, our world is lacking the most, in my view, is to increase the level of education. You know, when you think about women in many, many regions, um, in many countries, I think we still have huge progress to do and huge investment to do in this education field. I think we're going to uh, ask, the, the time has come for you to ask questions if there are any, if not, I can continue. Here we go. We have a question there. Could you please, we're gonna, you're going to have the microphone. Could you please introduce yourself and maybe you have a particular yeah. question to somebody of the speakers or to all of them. Yes, if I may. Uh, I will ask a question, but I'd like to show something what to you, it? if you don't is mind. Is it dangerous? It's very dangerous. No, it's very dangerous. dangerous. Don't, don't worry. It's just a chicken and an it's egg. It's a chicken. It's a yes, very dangerous let me, chicken. Let me give it to you. That's for mind. me. It's a dangerous yes. chicken for me. Yes. Thank yes. you very chicken much. Chicken and an egg. And an egg. Yes. And I hold it this way. Yes. Why am I showing this uh, chicken and the egg? It's because you've been talking uh, about trust a lot, trust and distrust. And the yeah. question, the problem with trust and distrust is that uh, it has remained so far the consequence of problems of our societies because no one has been able to measure uh, trust. So as long as it remains vague, uh, no one knows how to act on it, and when we act on it, it's too late. Now we can measure trust and the factors that are affecting trust or distrust in societies, whether it's in large companies, in govern public co political governance and so forth, and then we can realize that distrust is the cause of problems. As, that, as soon as it becomes the cause, then we can act on the cause more than the consequence. So that was just a comment. And I don't know if yourself in your uh, respective fields, have you considered trust or distrust as a cause or a consequence? <laughs> chicken and the egg? I have, a, yeah, egg. I have an illustration <laughs> for you. I'm not sure whether it's a chicken it's or the PowerPoint, egg. It's PowerPoint, you know? I'll, <laughs> I'll try to address that, at least from, from our perspective. Uh, so, as we talked about earlier, you know, at, at the core of Airbnb's success, we're 160 million people travel on it, we're in 65,000 plus cities, 191 countries, 215 nationalities, you know, is the concept of trust. You're going to stay in a stranger's home. Uh, and the way that we have sort of built around that trust is that guests and hosts uh, rate each other. They give each other star ratings. It's blind. Um, uh, and to stay on the platform, you know, you effectively need to get a four or five star rating. It's up to a five star rating. Uh, because if you don't, uh, people aren't going to invite you in as a guest and they're not going to necessarily want to stay at your home as a host. You know, I joke about the fact, and this is entirely true, that, you know, I traveled in hotels for 20 plus years and hotels are great. They've had the three best years they've ever had in their history. Uh, but when I travel to hotels, I never once made my bed in the morning. Uh, I make my bed every time I leave a host's home when I stay there. Uh, and that's reflective of the fact that I understand I'm going to someone else's home 
and I want to treat it the same way that I would that want them to treat my home. Um, and so ultimately, we're using our network platform in a small way to contribute to trying to re-enhance that concept of the social contract, that concept that per Pericles talked about, phylloxenia, right, bringing a stranger into your home. 70% uh, of the people who travel on Airbnb make the decision to do so based on the recommendation of a trusted friend or family member. Uh, so for us, we're looking at trust in an offensive, positive, affirmative way, uh, but do think that there are some lessons in that uh, for larger society. Um, but ultimately, we do not succeed but for the fact that we're a trusted platform. We actually see trust going up on our platform at the same time it's going down in virtually every other sector of society. I like the way you're holding it up, Oksana. So, so it's an illustration, you know. <laughs> I still don't know which one's the chicken, which one's the egg, but um, I, I think, you know, certainly in the case of Amnesty International, for example, uh, those who are the perpetrators of human rights violations, whether it's a government or company or a non-state organization, uh, I'd be very surprised if they trust Amnesty International because our job is to speak truth to power. But obviously, for those who are at the receiving end, those who are the subjects or victims of human rights violations, they don't have that many people they can trust because they're at the receiving end. So we have very high levels of trust. And generally speaking, if you look at the Edelman barometer, the trust level of civil society organizations also has dropped compared to you know where they were before. But when we do our studies, we find that because Amnesty doesn't take any money from governments or corporations, it's seen as independent and impartial. Uh, our trust level has actually gone up uh, in everything that we have looked at. So I think it's even hard to generalize civil society in one, put everybody in one box or media, because you have to be quite disaggregated. I think. Mr. Andal. Well, you know, for an organization um, like us, you know, the success of an organization any company is based on the engagement of people. And people will be engaged if they trust the organization. They trust where the company goes, they trust the management, they trust the ethics, they trust, you know, they are really um, trusting the integrity of the company. A and frankly, um, we do measure um, people engagement uh, through our 420,000 people. Um, and uh, actually, you know, more than 80% of the people of Sodexo trust us. If they trust us, we have a chance that they deliver a good product to our clients and that, you know, clients would trust us. So I think it's really fundamental and it's a driver of our business. Well, I think, I think it's both. I mean, if, if people are um, anxious, that drives mistrust and you've got that now and we will have it unless we actually do something about sharing prosperity, unless we do something about uh, the just transition pieces where people are guaranteed a future through the imperative of the shift from carbon-based uh, economies and uh, the, the imperative to deal with climate change. And it's the same thing for young people. They will trust if in fact they see a future. The consequences then of mistrust are many and varied. The best of them are that we get to organise, as uh, Shalil and others said, and people get out on the streets and change their circumstances. That's our job in large part uh, with uh, civil society, as, uh, as he said. But if they, it also causes then distrust of each other, which is the current divide in the breakdown of our societies. I mean, when you have whole communities in places like, uh, well, pick any country really, but Brexit's one of those targets, who walk down the, the different sides of the street, whether you're a Leaver or a Remainer, then you've got to rebuild that. So, you know, cause and consequence, depending on the circumstances, it's obviously both. But trust is an essence. If we don't trust in institutions, don't trust in democracy, don't trust in those who represent us, then ultimately we are going to see a society where conflict increases and you can already point to that rather than decreases. The reason I'm holding it like that during our, while our speakers were answering is also because if I may add to what you have already said, we, uh, you know, we discussed here the importance of the dialogue and the importance of discussing these issues and that's why you know, we to discuss it that openly 
hoping for finding a solution rather than pretending there are no issues here. That's why. That's for you. Ah, you see, there is no trust. Huh? <laughs> Taken back. Here we go. Please. Yeah, Professor Aman Agarwal from Indian Institute of Finance, based out of Delhi. Uh, my question is that they, for the last three decades, we've been seeing a steep rise in unemployment, inequalities of income, and on top of it, there is recently extensive debate. I have been at the IMF World Bank Forum meeting three weeks back at the ADME meeting in Yokohama as well. Extensive debates on uh, the gender gaps which are coming up in terms of pays and others which in fact is creating a gender divide now. It's not in fact removing the divide, it's creating further divide in gender. Given that, where do we see these digital dividends and the bridging of gaps which we are discussing and debating about going when people at home are not happy uh, because of these key concerns and the governments worldwide, whether it is developed worlds or developing regions, all of them, or emerging markets as well, are perplexed with these three questions. Uh, where are we seeing tomorrow? given unemployment, inequalities of income, and gen gender divides growing up, specifically because of these issues being raised now in these international forums. Thank you. Well, I mean, the rise of misogyny is shocking. I must say I didn't ever think that in 2017 we would have such gender divides, and we haven't solved the issues of the gender equation to date, and now we're creating more. You're absolutely right. It, we just, uh, I sat on the UN high-level panel for women, and three things that really matter to us that we think are in part the solution. One is we all have to tackle the violence against women. The question of violence against women is a non-negotiable. Any man, woman, or child who doesn't stand up against violence, then. And we can do something about it in our workplaces. We've been negotiating with employers and now Canada's thinking of a law and we hope others will follow that shows the workplace as a key actor. If women have some flexibility when they're subject of domestic violence, for example, to make sure they have protection orders and find safe haven, then actually productivity goes up in the workplace. But even if it didn't, that spirit of generosity we talked about ought to be something we care about. The second one is, in fact, to do something about the, the wages gap. And again, unless you have uh, formal work, uh, minimum wages and social protection, you won't reduce inequality generally, but for women, you have no hope. Collective bargaining on top of that is, of course, uh, part and parcel of sharing prosperity, but those fundamentals are there. And the third piece is about jobs. If you look at, at, at uh, the unemployment uh, stakes, then women are often not any longer represented in those who are unemployed in the participation uh, numbers or those seeking employment because they've simply given up. And, uh, and we know that as much as we support investment in infrastructure, the G20 supports it and so on, our research shows that investment in care, which is again at the heart of rebuilding our communities, actually gives a triple jobs dividend, primarily for women in the care economy enabling women to work, which is the G20 target of 25% increase by 25, because women are freed from care responsibilities to a large extent, and it gives a male dividend of around 4% in infrastructure and services. So, you know, we have the solutions. Again, it comes back to do we have the political will, and are people willing to again invest in each other? Stefan Loven, who runs that Miracle Economy, has actually promoted the Global Deal, and, uh, and it's all about dialogue, social dialogue, talking to each other, building the solutions together. And with business and labour, we absolutely promote that. But the solutions are there. The political will is the question. Yes, please. Just on the question of violence against women, I think uh, since you mentioned you're from Delhi as well, um, I'm from Bangalore, and we, we uh, in India, there's obviously been a lot of talk about violence against women. And uh, so, you know, I think it does finally boil down to the question of uh, why do men uh, do this? Or, you know, mostly men, I assume, when we talk about violence against women, uh, I think the, at the heart of it is the fact that they can get away with it. And so this is a kind of impunity question. So if a woman goes to a police station in India, it's true in many parts of the world, to file a report, to file a complaint against a man, 
the police stations are not very equipped to even take this. You know, very rarely do they actually accept the FIR. So we have a, in India what is called the first information report. If you go to a police station, you have to file a first information report that there was a violent attack against a woman. So we are now working with police stations in India to actually get the police to start understanding that when a woman comes, it's it's a very big deal for her to come and actually report violence, which is of, often intimate partner violence. So for her to come there and actually report it, but the police need a lot of training, a lot of re, re kind of, you know, positioning and at re attitude, sort of refashioning of attitudes. So a lot of ground level work is to happen and, and accountability and impunity are at the heart of a lot of these issues. You know, if you don't deal with it at the ground level, I think it will be a macro conversation. Yeah, I'll just add, first and foremost, this is just a basic human rights issue. Um, period, right? And it has no place, um, but it does exist out there. And I began, I think, with the very first question talking about the uh, roles of these digital platforms um, as they increasingly become bigger and bigger in society. And I have talked about the fact that digital platforms need to take responsibility. We simply can't say that we're a mirror to the good things and the bad things that exist in society. We actually have to partner with governments, with organizations like Amnesty, with others to begin to put in place policies and ways to address some of these things. Uh, because you just simply, what, what happens as these platforms become bigger and bigger is this age old behavior which is unconscionable but it migrates onto these platforms and platforms do need to take a role and responsibility in addressing them. As I said earlier, I don't wanna suggest that Airbnb is perfect, don't wanna suggest we have all the answers, uh, you know, but we have been doing some interesting stuff, particularly on the issue of uh, 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 economic issues for women. 55% of all the folks who make money on Airbnb are women. They've made $10 billion since the platform was created. Very hard to find an economic sector in society except very low ends, where the majority of the revenue is actually being made by women. Uh, we've actually uh, looked at doing, and we're actually doing specific programs in India uh, with the union that represents women, uh, also in Africa with a number of women organizations to actually find ways that we can use the platform to actually promote some of that economic equality, economic opportunities, specifically in India because of the empowerment issues that come from women being able to generate some of their own economics. Again, not suggesting that we have all the answers or that we're perfect on these things, merely putting that out there to say that platforms can and should and need to work to engage on these issues and partner with governments and organizations that are represented here on the stage. Well, you know, I, I said before that we, we, we specifically have a program, you know, to fight uh, gender violence. Um, and in India is, mm -hmm. is effectively there, but also in South America. It's about economic independence most of the time, you know, education and helping women to uh, create companies. So we've done that many times, create their own business, micro business, so that they can, we, so they so can buy from them and they can expand with other customers, but it's really about, you know, training, uh, awareness, finding job for the victims. It's a job on, you know, which has, which happens locally, um, you know, on the, on the ground. And I think we can, all of us, we can play a big role and companies like Sodexo certainly. Thank you. We have more, we have question there. Uh, yes. En français? Après, je traduis en fait. Myriam Perev, Compliance Officer, euh, Université de Paris-Saclay. J'ai une question à la société Airbnb, après à la société Solesco. Je vais traduire après en anglais en fait. Euh, la première question. Un peu plus fort, s'il vous plaît. D'accord. La première question, c'est euh, comment conciliez-vous en fait en, pour une société euh, du digital, donc du numérique, euh, la protection des droits et libertés fondamentaux? avec euh, les exigences et les impératifs de lutte contre le blanchiment de capitaux et du financement du terrorisme, en fait, pour euh, une société euh, comme Airbnb qui travaille sur le numérique. Comment faites-vous votre KYC, l'identification du client, euh, même si vous n'êtes pas assujetti au sens du code monétaire et financier français, en fait, euh, aux obligations en fait, de KYC Mais est-ce que have vous... A Thank you very much. We have it on the screens. Monsieur Angel, I think you're going to start, huh? I think you. <laughs> Thank you for the translation. Okay. Uh, so I think the question, as I understand it, deals with money laundering on and platforms. Protecting fundamental liberty. 
and protecting fundamental liberties. Thank you. Uh, so earlier I talked about the fact how our um, rating system works. And as I mentioned earlier, as a host or a guest, you do not remain on the platform uh, for very long unless you continually have a four or five star rating. That just builds in inherent levels of trust. But in addition to that, uh, we have all sorts of systems that are built into the platform. It begins with uh, a pretty robust uh, identity requirement so that we go through and make sure you, s you are who you say you are, uh, that you're someone who would reflect um, uh, uh, attitudes that would be consistent with the platform. Uh, we also have all sorts of um, algorithms that we run against uh, folks who are on the platform to make sure that uh, we're able to get signals back of something that's suggesting that someone may not be behaving or conducting themselves uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, third of all, we have something that's called the We Accept, um, which is we put in place a requirement that to be on the platform, you actually have to agree to, you know, in effect, a social contract mm -hmm. about how you will conduct yourself and how you will engage uh, on the platform. Uh, and then we partner with governments. We have 300 plus partnerships that we've put in place over the last year and a half uh, to work with governments to put in place um, all sorts of regulatory protections um, to be able to address issues that a particular government, a uh, particular city, particular state, particular country uh, may have. Uh, uh, and then the final piece I'll just mention, I think this really gets to the money laundering piece, is that uh, on the Airbnb platform, which is a little bit different than some of the other platforms, we handle the entire financial transaction. Uh, so we hold the money, uh, money comes through us. Uh, that allows us to put in place all sorts of protections, including issues that relate to money laundering. Uh, folks who are looking to do that type of behavior uh, are typically not going to do it on an Airbnb platform because of all the systems that we have in place, and in particular when it relates to money laundering, because we're the entity that actually controls the financial transaction, which then gives us an enormous amount of visibility into who's doing what and how they're doing. Um, again, no one is ever going to be perfect in this. We're constantly looking to how we can stay ahead uh, of where people are going. Um, and the fact that we have so much access to so much data and then are able to apply that data into constant learnings helps us stay ahead of the curve. Thank you. We have another question. Yeah, it's just here. Can we have the microphone? Mm -hmm. um, this works. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, good. Uh, my name's Jared. I work for the government of Western Australia. Um, just a question about leaving groups behind. Um, and we often talk about young people and talk about the effects that tech is having. Just thinking, um, are there any thoughts on leaving older people behind? Chris's comment before, for instance, that you, you're the 29th oldest person. Is that right? I am. Yeah. Just wondering, like, the companies in Silicon Valley, for example, have you know, strategies for engaging older people, like, you know, the majority of people for Brexit, for instance, were, who voted to leave were older, so people obviously got some insecurities there. Um, are there ways that we can engage older people more, perhaps? Thank you. Please. It's a, it's a great question, I think, um, not only for tech, but I think a larger issue for society. Um, you know, you've seen so many industries go through transitions when people lose their job or lose their economic opportunity at 30, 40, 50 years of age. Um, you know, and these, there's always a conversation about how do they go back and get access to education so they can potentially retrain themselves or get other opportunities. That's a lot easier to say, you know, in the abstract than it really is to translate into an actual practice, particularly if you're, you know, a 50-year-old who's spent their life working in an assembly line and suddenly you're being asked to go into an entire different field and you ne haven't necessarily continued with your education up to that point in time. I do think that there is a lot of conversations taking place about the role of education writ large and how we actually rethink about it. Uh, rethink it in um, many places in the world, uh, you know, including the United States, our in education system is based on an industrial age. Um, even the fact that you have the summers off was designed to sort of reflect how work schedules work. The actual school day used to reflect the people going to work and leaving work. Um, and I think we have to radically rethink the role of education. I believe it should be a lifelong uh, uh, learning session. You know, at one point in time, uh, and this was to the benefit all, of all of us, you know, organized labor helped put in child safety laws. They put in the 40-hour work week. They put in pension. They put in all sorts of protections. You know, I think one of the things that we should be thinking about is, you know, do you have a certain number of hours each week to actually be able to take classes to get educated over the course of your lifetime so that you're always positioned to be able to get those jobs in the future? There are uh, en entities in Silicon Valley uh, uh, including something like Udacity, which is providing online education to folks. Uh, there was a really interesting case involving AT&T, the tele 
telecom company in the US which worked with Udacity and Georgia Tech to actually create a program for its workers while they were working. So a line worker, someone literally putting lines up or connecting cable uh, television sets could actually enhance their education and have an opportunity to go into some of the new jobs that were being created at AT&T. I think that's a good example of how we need to begin to think about these things you know, in a larger way. Uh, on our platform, um, uh, you know, I mentioned that 60% of our travelers are hosts, uh, or 60% of our travelers are millennials. 55% uh, of our hosts, the people whose homes are being opened up, are women. The fastest growing cohort of our women hosts are senior women. Um, and the reason for that is, A, they're on fixed incomes and looking to make that supplemental income uh, at a time when, uh, you know, costs are going up. Uh, they often have empty spaces in their homes, their kids have left, or they're going to visit family. Um, and they get an enormous social connection from all the people that they get to meet who travel through their homes. Um, you know, again, a small way that, that we're doing it, but I do think ultimately this comes back to, you know, education has historically been the passport to economic opportunity, and we need to rethink how education is currently working so it really becomes a lifelong exercise. Ms. Tanda, I would, I would want your take on it as well, on this issue, please. Well, you know, the, it's actually a very, very good question, of it course, is. and all, all organizations are, are facing um, this kind of challenge. And, and frankly, um, you know, we have to make sure that uh, people from all generations can work together. Um, a, and, uh, you know, in the next uh, probably decade, we'll have maybe four generations working together. Um, so, and each of them have something to bring. And frankly, um, the challenge for a company like Sodexo is how do we maintain uh, you know, the, 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 the level uh, of uh, expertise at all level, um, everywhere, and it's about <laughs> continuous um, education and uh, how do we uh, continuously develop people for new business, for new jobs. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I think we, uh, we see also in these dynamics um, a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm, actually, from different generations to learn from each other. And I think this is uh, something that organization needs to really continue to promote. Yeah. I'm going to ask the same question. It's the time has come to, to do it once again. The question we open this session with. This is the second vote for everybody here. Please go back to your devices. Who do you feel can do most to address the growing divides in our societies? Governments, business, civil society, trade unions, or media? Let's see <laughs> the result now. After 90 minutes, whether anything changed within 90 minutes? That's too fast, probably. <laughs> Governments, business, civil society, trade unions, and media. The beginning is governments by far. That was the first, the very first answer. Okay, here we go. This is suspense. We're going to see the results somewhere now. Normally, I hope you have all voted. Yes. Well, governments, 40. If I'm not mistaken, there used to be 46 at the very beginning, wasn't it? Well, it feels good that we managed to, you know, to change altogether at least, uh, at least something here. I would like to thank all of our speakers for this very interesting panel. I would like to thank each of you here in the room. Unfortunately, we're running off time, of course. But thanks a lot, and it was very important that we were having this discussion all together here today. Thank you.